Hi, Alan. How are you doing? Yeah, good yourself. Thank you. I'm just checking if Yara is here. Let me see if she's mm -hmm. got. Uh, Before we before we start, I actually um, have from the, the people who signed up, some of them dropped in uh, questions for the session. So I have three questions from those guys. Shall I uh, post those in the beginning? Okay, we could we could do that as well. That is perfectly fine. Or or rather, maybe maybe what I could do is I'll set the context a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, I think that might make it easier to just go through things. Um, I'm okay. just trying to get. Yeah, and then we can go into the questions, I think. So for first five minutes, yep. really, on the setting of the context, and then we can go in. Yeah, uh, sweet. Let's do that. Do we need her to have any special permission or anything? Or uh, OK, OK, good question. Um, I believe she should already have been added. Uh, but she, she, she wants to make a, a request. I have a moderation panel. Um, so I should see a request to uh, enter so i can let her in okay and is there where how do you usually do that is there a button there to do that i think she's in, in our chat right now so okay she, um yeah. okay then then yara if you look at the top of the screen um I, I think there's a button that says like share audio video if you can press that one Yeah, I got your request. I'm going to go to you now and add you. And here we go. That worked. Easy, huh? Hello. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Can you hear me? Awesome. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, all good. Good. yeah it's good. Amazing. It's good. So, um, it's 50 minutes past. So, so let's begin. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, maybe let me just share my screen real quick so that I can just set the context a little bit and then we can go straight into the questions. So we will do that. Share screen, Chrome tab, key considerations, share. Okay. I'm hoping you can see this, correct? Yes, we can. Okay. Awesome. All right. So hello and welcome, everyone. Um, I am Buddha joining you today from Singapore in uh, in Singapore's evening. Uh, I'm product evangelist here at Tyke, and today I've been joined by um, Yara, who is our partner consulting engineer, also the go-to person when it comes to API management. So all of your questions um, as and when you have them during our session. Um, and of course, we have Alan, who's going to be moderating our session. and asking us the tough questions that you would be posing to us. So yes. with that, I want to take the first five minutes to sort of uh, just set the scene a little bit, and uh, then we'll go right into the questions. And if the questions do get exhausted, if at all that happens, then we do have a few more talking points which we can then uh, go over as well. So that's sort of the plan. Hopefully that's going to be, that, sound, that all sounds good. So key considerations when architecting API management solution. Um, I think we've gone through our introductions. There are really four key talking points that we're going to be talking about, um, starting off with just thinking about what or how your solution is really architected. I think the more we are moving these days, we're essentially moving towards an API first sort of an approach to, to products as well as businesses. Therefore, that brings um, a fair amount of flexibility, but brings a, a few amount of co complexities as well. And, and we've seen that um, in certain industries specifically uh, more than the others. So we, want, we thought to, to sort of bring about a few of these key considerations when we are architecting these solutions. Um, just thinking about how, say, modern products are sort of built at this stage, essentially a lot of it tends to be microservices driven. Um, of course, you could have your own, um, own own opinion whether microservices is the way to go or whether a monolithic approach sort of works for you. There is no right or wrong answer. I do believe it's a more use case driven approach to this than anything else. But we can discuss about that as well if if that is one of your burning questions. So imagine having these these microservices driven um, microservices powering your back end, which then are being exposed to APIs 
which then get then get consumed through your modern applications, whether that is web application or it is a mobile application, and then that is being consumed by your users. So that's sort of the typical workflow that we've seen, especially in an API-driven world. Of course, a little bit on a simplified style, but but that's what we've seen uh, seen to be happening. Where sort of I think where we come in, where where Tyke or an API management product comes in, is sort of in that that middle layer where it's it's essentially a mechanism to manage some of these uh, different complexities, maybe around around APIs and managing those those different APIs, whether that is from a security perspective, whether that is compliance, scalability, and governance perspective, and each of them sort of uh, each of these key considerations are concerns sort of are being addressed um, from the perspective of, of an API management solution. It sort of talks a little bit into, into these more administrative side of things, which, which would make things very, very easy or simpler in terms of actually developing your API products as you move along so that you yourself can be focused on actually the business logic of how your microservices are architected or how your products are actually developed. So that's sort of sort of the little baseline. I think I can we can go into the details of each one of these considerations, but perhaps we'll start off with some of the questions and then go into into these uh, specific ones. So I'll stop sharing and I'll, I'll pass this on to Alan, and he can pose a few questions to us, and let's take it from there. Which I have not seen before the session. Yes, we we haven't seen most of these questions before. Some of some of them we have. Uh, but but hopefully it's going to be an exciting exciting little ride for us. So I think I'm I'm quite excited to see what people are worried about. Yeah yeah let's uh, let's put some of these questions up. So um, the guys who registered for this roundtable they post some questions in advance. So these are the ones I'm forwarding to you now. Um, but you know if you're in the audience and you you have any additional questions, please just feel free to type them in uh, and I'll read them out as we go along. So. Um, so the first question we got was, what are the best practices when starting to design an API-based architecture? Okay, um, I can take this one, but Yara, I think you are the, the best person for this. So by all means, go ahead. Um, I, I actually find it, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to answer because um, it's, it's a list of, things that you would need to address and you need to basically map your um, organization all the requirements you need to gather all the requirements of your specifically to your organization and to see why you need it and when you need it so back then when we had only maybe web server and then one backend that had everything in it then maybe it was it was a things looked a bit different, but now when you have a few teams working on a, on different products, uh, the release is composed of services, which, you know, microservices that we call, and you have different backends, then it's, it's a bit more complicated. So I would suggest to, first of all, understand the scope. What is it that you need to, to protect? First of all, map it and see what you want the, um, the management gateway to do. Okay, so some have only requirements for maybe keys. Maybe they handle it all for now, I'm saying, because I, I don't think it's the best way to do it um, in-house unless you're a massive uh, software company in, uh, uh, you know, in your own rights. Um, but some, some wants just a developer portal to 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 uh, self-cater keys. Some actually wants to protect APIs. So you need to understand which security requirements you have of the country that you're in and of the organization that you work for. And what, for example, if it's a bank, then you might have really strict requirements that you know in advance. If you are in a private company, maybe you can choose it and then you can just go for the default OpenID Connect that everyone are using. Mm -hmm. um, you need to understand um, which, if you are using identity provider, maybe you want to add an, identi an external identity provider to to your um, to your environment. So basically, you need to sit down and list Google. I, I would say Google and, <laughs> and look for all those requirement, all those um, needs, and then continue from there. Because once you understand what you need you can see how um, an API a gateway can help you. So what exactly it's going to do? It can take care of security, it can take care of um, 
few changes in the API in the request, it's modified. Um, it might need to, to handle uh, different protocols. You, you need to know that. And then when you go to vendors, you need to, to basically check that they have all the, all the things that you need. Next step would be how you actually use it in your organization. If it's one, one person, one team, you can use, for example, even in type the open source and that's it. But actually when it's more than one team and you want different people to have different um, rights, then you need an API management. So different people have different views of, on the system. And some can view analytics, some can create APIs in the, on the gateways and some create keys. So all this is really needed when you're an organization that is using role-based access control. Otherwise it's really impossible to handle like any other application. I think, I think, I think that... adding, adding on to that, I think, I think there are, there are a couple of, couple of facets there. I think you, you started off very, very okay. well in terms of the, the requirements. I think that is always the first step, I think, because that kind of enables you to think about, you know, how does your solution, what kind of considerations you need to make from a security perspective, from a scalability perspective, who is going to be your audience, where is your system essentially going to be hosted? What kind of compliances do you need to have with that? And then, you know, going to governance you know, ongoing basis, how big is your team? And then depending on that, do, do you then automate certain things? Do you still do things manually? What, what kind of scope do you need to really go into? I think requirements probably a good starting point. Um, but even in just, just in terms of API first businesses, there is, there is this aspect of API development where you're trying to build out the product. Then there is the aspect of API management where you're essentially trying to manage and administer all of these different aspects of APIs that, that you're trying to build and expose. And then finally, you're also looking at exposing those APIs that you have created for the development of actual products because your, your own business may not be utilizing it. It might actually need to be consumed externally. So what kind of rules would you be putting for those kind of things? Um, and then finally, thinking about API governance on an ongoing basis. What kind of versioning strategy should you be having? What kind of retirement strategies should you be having? What kind of role-based access do you need to have that different team members can actually do different things without breaking your system on an ongoing basis? So I think those are those are all the different, I would say, um, aspects of it. You think about development, you think about management, you think about exposing, and then you think about governance. There are four key almost elements that you have to think about and architect your solution accordingly. Um, I think that... You know, I, I, do you want to move to the next question or? Yeah, continue if you have something else to say, why not, yeah. So I think it's important to choose a solution that is very flexible. Hmm. It needs to be able to, if you want cloud or if you want on-prem or hybrid, so, sometimes it's it could be difficult. It depends how it was created and built from ground up. So it's really important to know that. Um, also, another thing that is, is really important, something that I really like about Tig is it's an open source. That means that the component that handles your traffic, you can always see the code that that what it's doing. And it's really important, uh, I think, the way I see it from security perspective. Sure. Um, and another thing I wanted to <laughs> add about this, Okay, I don't remember, but okay. <laughs> I think that so, actually, actually speaks, is, on, speaks to compliance as well. I think we were, we were discussing data sovereignty recently as well. And I think that's where transparency when it comes to actually creating solution becomes quite important, especially the way you handle data, whether that is at rest or in transit becomes quite important. And to be having that layer of transparency, I think becomes uh, pretty handy when it comes to compliance requirements. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. and another thing I remember now, um, lightweight. It needs to be also lightweight. So maybe you want to chain gateways, you want to put some gateways near your users at the edge, and then you want to put gateways near your uh, APIs. You have different requirements. Some have caching, some would do um, maybe termination of TLS, some would do the transformation, and maybe they can use the caching for many users. So all these requirements, when a gateway is a massive component versus very lightweight, really affects it. And in terms of you know provisioning costs, it's also very important. So, yeah, very good, very good. I think you guys have a great idea for a uh, blog post after this, right? <laughs> Top ten best practices for yeah. Best practices, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. 
Cool. So uh, on to the next question, a security security related question. It was how to reduce security issues when developing APIs. Okay, I mean, that's an interesting one because I'm not sure you are looking to reduce security when it comes to developing APIs um, or API first businesses. I would assume what they are trying to ask is how do you reduce the complexity in actually building products? And how do you take, you know, have a peace of mind when it comes to actually securing your APIs a little bit better? So typically, I think what used to happen, I think, before API management gateways and things like that came in was that you had to, you sort of started building in your security logic with alongside development of your own either microservices or your APIs themselves. So they were fairly tightly coupled or that's what it used to be before. And I think what we have started moving towards is this having this additional layer, which is where I think we, we talk about the, the API gateway of the management platforms, which have now started taking charge of things like security and, and things like versioning and, and, and a lot of these other management and administrative things, which are very, very critical. They're an integral part of developing your API products, but they are not essentially business logic. So it allows people or API first businesses to focus on their own um, I would say business logic part of things when it comes to the back end, but the API gateway sort of takes care of some of these um, security requirements. Then it comes down to, okay, what are your security requirements? I think at a base level, you might be looking at, I don't know, authentication token perhaps, or you're looking at being compliant with OAuth 2.0 um, systems. And that could be one of the, one of the requirements that you want to go for. Um, or you might want to have OAuth 2.0 with OIDC working well together. So, I think, it, again, it'll come down to requirements, but I think in terms of simplification, what something like Tyke or, I wouldn't say this is only a, the domain of Tyke, but API management platforms in general, what they allow you to do is to, they usually come with these uh, either plugins or, or security um, benefits built into the system that you can simply plug into um, out of the box and you can start working with it. So you don't have to add these additional code or build out these additional code. That might mm -hmm. require a whole lot of time, which you need to maintain and all of those things it takes away. And beyond that, even if you want to look at, say, you have customized custom requirements of, of authentication, you can build that out as well because you can, most of these platforms tend to be extendable. We definitely are extendable platform when it comes to that. And going even further beyond, if you are all, if you already have systems in place, uh, if you're a large organization, which has say identity providers that are, uh, taking care of the identity management across the entire organization for other things. And what you don't want to end up doing is having yet another system, having yet another user profile and user management system coming in. So what, again, an API management platform, in this case, us, the Tyke, we can do is we plug in very well with IDPs as well. And that makes the overall process fairly seamless. So we become sort of enablers of API development, enablers of API governance, and uh, ideally fit in and make life easier as opposed to adding to the complexity. I think that's that's our objective usually. Cool. Uh, and Yara, do you wanna do you wanna add to that? So how to reduce security issues when developing APIs? Um well in I think I, I, Buddha you covered most of it. That's basically you reduce it by not redeveloping it in every team. Yep. Um, and let let one team the, or the gateway to take care of that. I, I think, and that's a good point to show. No, 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 it's okay. Sorry, my bad. So on that, as I said before, that it's an open source. Again, even in that, you can see how we take care of that by the gateway. So you can see the libraries. If there is a problem, you can fix it. If someone, you know, finds an issue, we can always um, then take care of the fix because we own the whole stack which is uh, makes us makes things very easy for us. And, and it's quite important to know as well, when it comes to things like security, I don't think most people don't want to be reinventing the wheel. I mean, we don't want to be reinventing the wheel. Most of the solutions or most of the problems are either have already exactly. been highlighted or yeah. there is a solution that exists out there. So it's just a matter of finding what is the right solution for you mm -hmm. and then implementing that yes. a little bit better. So you don't have to invent yeah. a new encryption strategy because your data is that way. I think the encryption studies are already there. It's just whether we are adhering to that and making use of it easily or not. Yeah, it makes sense. I can share, I can share that a really um, good example that I like is to have um, mutual TLS between the client and the gateway. So that is taken all care by the gateway. 
basically whitelist all your users, all, your, all the API consumers, and then you take care separately about the connection between the gateway and the upstream. So it could be another um, MTLS, mutual uh, TLS, or maybe you can do request signing as well. So they share a secret. If there is a problem to do MTLS, and we we cover that as well, and that's basically separation of concerns. Yep. I, I'm making notes here as we go along as well. <laughs> so uh, the the last question I have from my list anyway is, um, what are the success factors for high quality API application design? Success. Um, I think that, that's, that's a good one again, but again, I, I think we have to keep, I'm, I'm harp, I feel like we are harping on this question over and over again, but it really comes down to what are you trying to measure? Like what is, I think you define your, I mean, definition of success and what, what that means to you. Um, in, in some cases that might be, again, depending on what kind of business you are in, what kind of product it is, what kind of vertical it is, it could mean very different things. Um, for, for, a, for a B2B business, for instance, it is how, how easily are people consuming our APIs? How easy have we made their business to actually succeed? And I think that's where someone like us, we sort of come in. Our, our measures, our metric of success tends to be tied to how our customers are really doing and how they're using our platform. How easy have we made it for them to get started? The time in terms of which you, know, you can go from zero to hello world, I think that little time frame that could be a measure of success for us. How easy have we made it for, say, e-commerce businesses to monetize their APIs a little bit and expose that out to the external world? That could be one of the metrics. From an analytics perspective, how easy have we made it for businesses to, um, to, to integrate with, say, business intelligence tools, for instance, which would give them way better insights? And, you know, we've got this up and running really, really quickly. In terms of offerings, whether, you know, if, if people want to be on the cloud and get up and running really, really quickly, do we have that capability? In terms of open source, can we get started and customize the level of customization that we can bring with an open source gateway? That could be a measure of success. So I think it really boils down to what kind of measure of success that you want to define for your own business. What can say here is, um, and I think maybe Yara, could, you could talk about some of the customers that we work with and the success stories around them. But I think what we've seen is we have sort of supported businesses across various verticals and with range of requirements. And so far, I think the, the, the way we, have, we are sort of positioned at this point of time is really as enablers of business success um, in terms of whatever they're trying to do, whether that is from an analysis perspective, whether that is simply exposing it, whether that is securing, whether that is low latency consumption of uh, APIs. I think so far we've, we've been fairly successful across these, these different things capability-wise. Um, and we are now taking on the challenge of, of GraphQL and making things very, very simple in that sense as well, where we have this amazing universal data graph that essentially combines all of these different data sources, um, in, including REST and, and SOAP. And I did the workshop yesterday. And you could combine all of these to create this unified experience without the need of any kind of custom middleware in the middle. So you can effectively turn your REST endpoint backend solution into a GraphQL um, frontend in less than five minutes. So that is fairly powerful because it saves businesses a whole lot of money because otherwise you will have to either migrate your entire stack from a REST backend into a GraphQL backend, or you might have to create this entire custom middleware, which having tested it out myself, would take at least 40 to 45 minutes for individual uh, resolvers to be written. And we have sort of reduced that down to about five minutes. So I think that's where we have, we have our objective has really been the success, driving the success of our customers. Um, I can talk about, you know, the, the diverse needs for uh, any client. So some clients, they just want to be up and running as soon as, as, soon as possible. They would choose a cloud solution, for example. Mm -hmm. They just want to connect their backends on one side and give it to consumers and for them they trust us to basically provide everything in between so they want to be able to configure it very easily so for them the success is how easy is their um, ux or dx uh, journey right so they can just quickly create apis and start start proxy so that's that's one way um, for others they just want the open source so they need really good uh, developer experience to be able to 
spin it up. Um, what I find success is if I manage to demo Tyke and I don't see eyes rolling or looking at me like they're not with me. So, yeah, so for me, it's important that our, our structure is quite simple. It's quite clear to understand. Mm -hmm. You have this component, this component, that component, and that's it. And it's not too, too complicated to understand the relationship between all the components. And, and it, it makes sense. So there's an API gateway, there is an API gateway. There's um, caching used by Redis, and that's it. All the gateways are sharing the same Redis, that's it. Nothing behind it. We also use uh, for open source and for a client, the same gateway. So it's very, very clear to understand. So for me, it's it's a success when you know you do a review and you check a few vendors what they're left with. And if they could basically upload it to their brain, then that's that's it. It's easy for them to understand. They can start doing whatever they want. Obviously, there are complicated flows mm -hmm. because we which were created for clients. So we are very driven by clients. And maybe that's another another thing that um, our clients really like. We listen a lot and we love feedback and we try to iterate with clients. So for example, GraphQL, we went to clients, they gave us feedback and we iterated over that to, to provide them with uh, this solution and understand what is needed because we don't want to write something that no one will use. That makes a, a lot um, of sense. Or, the, or, or our, yeah, exactly. And our cloud, for example, our new cloud, is basically an on-prem as a service because we realized that our previous cloud was not exactly what people wanted and now people want to pay more but still get their the feeling of on-premise but they just don't need to to handle that that's perfect yeah. and and that's what thanks we offer. a lot yeah exactly so guys i'm afraid <laughs> i was very interested i know we could keep going but uh i have to go to the next round table but uh that was a lovely discussion thank you so much and uh catch you next time yeah thanks